Well, needless to say, the 2013 NFL season for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers organization was a bit of a disaster. Greg Schiano had run amok. His players lost all respect for him. The whole Josh Freeman debacle, it was just an ugly season. So not surprisingly, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were ready to move on. They fired general manager Mark Dominic. They fired head coach Greg Schiano. And they have a new era that has begun under general manager Jason Light. And then, of course, head coach Lovey Smith, somebody that I'm very familiar with, with his nine years as the head man for the Chicago Bears. Now, it wasn't surprising to me to see the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, be very big players in free agency this past offseason, going after guys like Michael Johnson and Alteron Werner, two guys that seem to me to fit really well with Lovey's Tampa 2 cover 2 defense, and then also focusing some on the offensive side of the ball by signing center Evan Dietrich Smith away from the Green Bay Packers, a great signing for that organization, uh, signing offensive tackle Anthony Collins, and then bringing in veteran quarterback Josh McCown to kind of be the quarterback of the now to bring some leadership and in the future maybe be a solid backup of veteran presence to whatever young quarterback the Buccaneers go with long term. Uh, what we know about Lovey Smith is that Lovey Lovey's the cover two. And that is going to be the identity of his team, is his defense and their ability to adapt and adjust to running that cover two defense. And Lovey's going to ultimately succeed or fail based off of the success or failure of that defense. Now my question for Lovey Smith as he begins his tenure as the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is he going to learn from his experience in Chicago, the good, the bad, the ugly? Is he going to take what he did well there and try and incorporate it in Tampa? Is he going to take the experience of what didn't go so well in Chicago and learn from it and do better in Tampa Bay? And that ultimately will be the lesson or not the lesson, but what we look for long-term with Lovey Smith as he is the man in Tampa Bay. I also had questions, too, about whether or not Mike Glennon was really going to be the guy long-term, if Lovey Smith was really going to be sold on a guy that was a third-round pick from another regime. Was he going to sit there and say that Mike Glennon could be his guy? Because one of those experiences that Lovey Smith should have learned from during his time in Chicago is what mediocre to crappy quarterback play can mean for your organization, even if you have a great dominant defense like the Bears did for several years under Lovey. If you don't have that quarterback, you have nothing at all. And the Bears found that out sometimes the hard way. And Lovey Smith in particular found that out the very hard way because in large part, that's why Lovey Smith is no longer the head coach of the Chicago Bears. So heading into this 2014 NFL draft, I was wondering, are they going to go quarterback in round one? Are they going to try and find that long-term answer? Is Lovey Smith going to focus on his strength and try and beef up the defensive side of the ball and make Tampa Bay potentially an elite defensive unit? Are they going to go a little bit of here, there, and everywhere? What were they going to do? I was actually surprised and maybe a little bit pleasantly surprised because with Lovey Smith being a defensive-minded head coach, I thought his first draft was at least going to center somewhat on the defense, if not primarily on the defense, and I was just flat out dead wrong. The entire draft in 2014 for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers was dedicated to the offensive side of the football with a big emphasis on skilled position players. That surprised me quite a bit. And maybe, again, this is Lovey learning from that experience in Chicago of, hey, you can have the greatest defense in the world, but if you don't have an offense that could put up some points, it's ultimately not going to matter, and you're never going to reach the ultimate goal of the Super Bowl. In terms of the best pick that they had, I think Mike Evans, their first-round pick, number seven overall, the wide receiver out of Texas A&M. The thought of Vincent Jackson and Mike Evans on the outside, you know, for at least in 2014, maybe a guy like Josh McCown, or maybe if McCown doesn't do well or he gets hurt, maybe somebody like a Mike Glennon. You know, for Lovey Smith in Chicago, he saw what the potential of a Brandon Marshall and Alshon Jeffrey on the outside could be, even though he really didn't get to see it up close and personal in 2013. He saw some of the flashes in 2012 of how important that could be to have those two big physical kind of game-breaking wide receivers on the outside for your quarterback. So so it's not surprising to me to see him at the end of the day when Mike Evans dropped to number seven to go after him and say, hey, Vincent Jags is my Brandon Marshall. Mike Evans could potentially be my Alshon Jeffrey. And in terms of the best value that he had, I would say getting a guy like Robert Heron in round number six, a guy from Wyoming, a kind of quick twitch slot wide receiver, not the quickest guy necessarily in the world or the fastest guy in the world, sometimes with inconsistent hands, but also at times demonstrated to me an ability to get open 
and to make some big time plays and in particular play big in big games, see his performance against Texas. And to get a guy like that in the middle portion of round number six, I thought was a tremendous value for this Tampa Bay Buccaneers organization. Basically kind of maybe a replacement for the guy that they traded away to get that six round pick in Mike Williams, their fourth round pick a few years ago from Syracuse. In terms of a guy that could surprise, I think it could be Charles Sims, a running back from West Virginia. A lot of people are questioning, why would they draft a Charles Sims when you already have a Doug Martin and a Mike James and a Bobby Rainey? Now keep in mind, two of those three guys finished the season on injured reserve. Also keep in mind that if you were going to hit your wagon long term to a Bobby Rainey at this point with only some flashes of what he could do, you know, that's kind of foolish. And in the third round, to be able to get a complete back like a Charles Sims, a guy that is very good as a pass catcher out of the backfield, you know, I thought was good, decent value. And I think it could surprise people. I mean, if Doug Martin gets hurt again, or a guy like Mike James or Bobby Rainey can't step into the fold, a guy like Charles Sims could be a nice multidimensional running back. And in particular, at worst case, be that effective change of pace to Doug Martin and be a guy that can also do some nice things in the passing game on third downs. Now, in terms of the Buccaneers draft, I do have to question a couple of things. Number one, they did not take a single quarterback in this entire draft, and I found that to be a little surprising and maybe a bit of a mistake. At number seven, they were in position to take a guy like a Bridgewater or a Manziel, or maybe they could have found a way to trade back and still take that guy. Or maybe they could have traded back up into the bottom portion around number one to get either one of those guys, maybe a Manziel or a Bridgewater. But in general, throughout this entire draft, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at no point in time addressed the quarterback position. The only way they really did was with an undrafted free agent like a Brett Smith, who I think it was a crime, wasn't drafted. But at the end of the day, I was surprised that they didn't draft one at some point in time. Are you really confident as a Buccaneers organization, as a head coach like Lovey Smith, rolling into your 2014 season with Josh McCown being backed up by Mike Glennon? Is Mike Glennon really the guy long term? Do you really want to hit your wagon ultimately to somebody else's quarterback? And that's an interesting question, and that's a question that they seem to answer here that maybe they are, and I don't know if that was the best decision or not, because I can assure you of this, there was at least one, if not two, real long-term franchise quarterbacks available in the 2014 NFL Draft, and I can assure you that the Buccaneers passed on two of them. And as a result, long term, are they going to look back on this draft and say, yeah, we got some talent here, we got some pieces here. Well, we didn't address the most important position with a long-term answer, our guy, and maybe that was a mistake. I also thought that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers could have done a little bit more to address the defensive side of the ball. Look, Lovey Smith is a defensive-minded head coach, and ultimately a lot of the success or failure of his tenure and his regime is going to be measured by the performance of that defense. And that is a talented defense with guys like Gerald McCoy and Michael Johnson and Levante David. You know, they have talent. They're bringing in an Alteron Werner as well. You know, a guy like Mark Barron, who I think will fit very nicely as a safety in Lovey's cover two system. But they didn't address defense at all at any point in time. And I wonder if Tampa's going to look back long term and wish they would have taken Aaron Dottle number seven. Because part of Lovey's success in Chicago was having a nice interior rotation of defensive tackles. Primarily the two, three technique guys that he had in Tommy Harris and Tank Johnson. He has that Tommy Harris type of guy, so to speak, and a Gerald McCoy. I wonder if he really wanted to maybe take a Aaron Donald to be that Tank Johnson type of guy, that Henry Melton type of guy. And I wonder if he was overruled here by focusing on wide receiver at number seven. So again, not taking quarterback, not going defense at any point in time in this draft was a bit surprising to me. In terms of the final grading of the Buccaneers draft, I gave him a C plus. You could kind of see where they went with the best player available strategy, especially in the early portion of the draft, the first three rounds. They got a guy like Mike Evans at number seven, it was surprising that he was there, so they jumped on him. Austin Safarian Jenkins, you know, he was a guy that a lot of people had rated as a late first or early second round pick. They maybe felt he was the best player available at the board, and he filled a big-time position of need of tight end. If you're going to just rely on Brandon Myers, your free agent acquisition, and Tim Wright, eh, you're wishing and hoping. So why not bring in a guy with big-time potential like an ASJ? You know, and then even Charles Sims in the third round out of West Virginia, a running back that a lot of people didn't like to pick, but I happened to. Again, good value here. I was surprised, though, again, that they went all offense, even more surprised that they didn't go after a quarterback at any point in time. They had a total of six picks here. Uh, their fourth and fifth round picks, or excuse me, their fifth round picks, uh, Edwards and Panfile. 
uh, I don't know. That seemed to be a little bit off. There, to me anyway, seemed to be better players on the board at that time, and maybe that was a position or time in the draft where you could have maybe addressed your defensive backfield or maybe your linebacking core or maybe tried to find some depth on your defensive line. So again, the Buccaneers did get better in this draft. I do like, in theory, that Lovey Smith wasn't afraid to go on the offensive side of the ball here. Just a little surprised they didn't go quarterback, a little surprised, too, that they didn't focus on defense at any point in time. We'll see how this best player available strategy works out for them, and I'm sure Buccaneer fans at least have to be a little bit more excited about what's coming up in the 2014 season now.